Thank you, Brandon. Thanks for that prayer as well over us. Uh, it's great to see you. Nothing says summer has arrived like VBS, at least around here. Um, so I, we're going to let the kids take over the campus, and it's always a fun time to be here. Um, as TJ noted, others, let's, let's go. You can still dive in, jump in, and be a part of it, of it all, okay? I, um, I love summertime. And I don't know if you're going to be able maybe to get away. Does anybody have any plans? Um, anybody go to Colorado in, in the summer? Anybody? I know some of y'all do. Like Texas takes over Colorado, it seems. Um, later in July, we're going to be able to, uh, as a family, some of y'all know, we're, we're going to be at Wind River Ranch. It's a place up near Estes Park, and we're going to be there. It's a Christian guest ranch, and I'll, I'll speak, and we have worship and all the things. It's a real significant place for us through the years where we made some significant decisions and um, have, have experienced a lot of memories as a family, and we've also made lifelong friends there uh, with people, some of y'all, um, and others from all over the, the nation, I guess around the world. But um, one of the things we love to do, among the many things, is to go on hikes. Like, I don't know if any have any climbers here, mountain climbers, but um, there's some great, it's, it looks right over the Rocky Mountain National Park, and it's beautiful, and it's, there's Long's Peak, um, one of the 14ers that I've done a couple times. Um, I have a friend of mine, he might be in the room, uh, Tyler Cooper, Dr. Cooper, some of y'all might know, he has actually done all the continental 14ers that there are, okay, among many other climbs around the world, which I think are 67 of them. But um, so MBD, like I've done a few, you know, that's about it. Um, But what I have learned among the many analogies uh, that we can always draw from when you think about a group hiking, going up, you know, find the summit and all the things, among the many analogies is is the fact that if the harder the climb, the more you need a guide, right? Like, especially Long's is, is not the hardest, but it's one of the hardest. And people die up there every year doing Long's and, and summoning and coming back. And you have to do something crazy to actually die up there. Um, but you probably don't know what you're doing if that's happened. Or you don't have someone who's guiding you. Like, don't go down there. No, no, stay up here. Be careful here. On, you know, the ledges, it's called, or uh, this portion here. There's certain, the narrows. You got to be careful at some points. But you have to have a guide. It's really helpful. Uh, I had a friend of mine who just had a family member did Mount Everest like a week ago. And you have to have a guide like who knows exactly what's doing. You want your guide to be clear. Like, let's be really explicit. Don't go that way. Don't go that way. Or if it's a simple climb or or hike, it's like, here's a great place to stop and have lunch. Or here's a great place you can... Look at this view. It's amazing. Like, don't go down there because that's a little sketchy. So all along the way, to be really clear about what you're doing, you need a guide who's qualified. Somebody who's actually been there, done that. That's helpful. And you need an expert the harder the climb. And especially if you're doing a face, you know, climb or something. But then you also need one who's constant would be really helpful. Like, don't leave me. Like, you just stay with us the whole time all the way up and back down. And today we're going to talk about Jesus, the better guide. The whole book of Hebrews is about how Jesus is better. He's better than angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than any king who's come along. And what's happening in the book of Hebrews, you can turn to Hebrews 1, in fact, is where we're going to be. Um, if you didn't guess that, but we're going to dive into um, the whole book of Hebrews and we're going to be reading, by the way, if you haven't picked up your, your, your new bookmark, you can find them right outside the room here. You can find it online as well, but um, make sure you grab one of these because our entire church family, you don't have to be a member to do this. We'd love for you to join us, everybody doing this together. And then we're keeping each other accountable. You can do like me, have, have a roommate or a friend, uh, a roommate, <laughs> Stacy is doing this with me. Um, <laughs> Uh, but if you have a roommate, um, but I have friends, my point is I have friends doing this with me who don't even live here in Dallas and we're doing it together and I'm doing it with our staff. We'll ever, you know, lot, most meetings, Hey, turn to your neighbor and talk about what you're learning because we're keeping each other accountable. You can do this parents. You can do this in your home. You can do it in the family. You can talk about God's word every single day. So Make sure you grab one of these. What we're doing is we're going to be reading through uh, the book of Hebrews and intermixed there is the book of Exodus. We're going to be reading as well because uh, they both explain the other. And as we'll see today, the writer is writing to a group of Jewish Christians in the first century, about 30, 20, 30 years after Christ has been crucified. So there are people among them who like I saw him alive. I mean, these are people who, who, who believe and that he is Lord. They're formerly Jews who become Christians, thus Hebrews. 
Um, they live in a global city context in a pluralistic society. Okay, track all the, the, you know, the par- parallels here with us. Um, they know scripture a lot better than us, by the way. The writer assumes they understand all of Israel's history and assumes that they understand the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, which comes to play over and over again, even as we'll see today. Um, they are people who are being uh, not just oppressed, they're being persecuted. We see in chapter 10, among other places, um, they are a minority group who is following after this new Lord Jesus, which was difficult, challenging enough uh, in Rome, in the, in the empire, because only, there's only one Lord and it was Caesar. And to say otherwise could, could get you put to death. So imagine these, these Christians trying to live out their faith in a pluralistic society where they're they're persecuted. They had another temptation. As former Jews, they had this, this temptation to say, hey, you know what? We've got all the pieces in place. Like we understand he's the creator, a monotheistic God, but then he came and showed himself to us in Jesus. We've got all the history. And now Jesus has come to fulfill his like the messianic um, hope that we've been waiting on, and he's the one. And so um, we, we've, you know, we've we got added him to the mix, but can't we like not... Could we just kind of keep going back to, even back to the law? Like, that's a lot safer. Even in this context, a minority group of Jews had more rights, if you will, or a little bit safer than it was to be this proclaimer of this new thing, the Jesus movement. And so they were tempted to go back to the law. But here's the thing. You can see all the parallels for us. We live in a growing, okay, pluralistic society. That's not a, that's not a bad thing or evil thing. It's a thing. Um, it, it, we, we live in a, in a place where it seems more and more that we're marginalized as Christians along the way, not persecuted like them. So don't, don't claim that we are not, not in the least. Um, but it becomes more and more difficult. And at times, some of you are in different contexts or conversations or families or places where you go, it'd be a lot easier for me. I mean, if I understand Jesus, right. And all the stuff that I'm hearing preached and what I see in the Bible, it seems like it demands everything that I've got, like a radical devotion to him. It's a lot safer for me just not to, not to go there. Like in certain places in my life, just I, a lot safer if I just kind of blend in, kind of, kind of just go there. And we all, by the way, also have this default mode back to the law. I think it was Martin Luther who said um, the default mode of the human heart is the law. I don't know how you translate default mode from German back in the 1500s, but, um, but it, it is that like, like we're always going back to the law, like what, and meaning what I can do to be good enough to justify myself before God. That was their great temptation. And it's ours as well. The writer of Hebrews then comes in and he, she, we don't know who it is exactly delivers by saying, no, 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 don't drift away. I'm going to tell you why you need to stay in. Be encouraged. That's the whole point of the book. You want to give up. Don't do it. And we're going to see that today. Now, I say that. We don't know who the writer was. Many have said, well, it was Paul. Clearly Paul, because it's someone in the apostolic circle of people. There's a couple of points along the way why people argue it's not Paul. We'll see one of them today. But um, like Charles Spurgeon, among a, Spurgeon, when he writes, he's just, Paul said, Paul, Paul said this, Paul said this. We'll probably say the writer of Hebrews often, some said it's Apollos, some say Barnabas. If it wasn't Paul, we have no clue who it was, is kind of where a lot of scholars go to. So wherever you fall on that, it's not, you know, not salvific information or something. Um, eternity doesn't weigh in the balance. But we're going to see here that uh, it is someone who has heard directly. Okay, so Jesus okay, speaks to the apostles. And then there was this thing of those who heard from the apostles. And that's essentially, it seems, um, this is a person who was, who was in the mix. So very aware and in the circle of the first uh, disciples, apostles of Jesus. And today we're going to see that Jesus is a better guide. Because he is clear, he's qualified, and because he's constant. All right, so first of all, let's dive in. This is a great passage. Um, He is clear, verses 1 through 4, meaning he's explicit, he's distinct, and he has communicated to us. One of the themes in the book of Hebrews is that God (laughs) speaks. He actually has spoken to us. Now, he's totally other than us, so how would he speak to us? Look at this in verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Now, pause for a minute. There's two words here, polymeros and polytropos in in the Greek. 
and, and all that, you hear poly, like multiple, many, uh, many meros, many times eras along the way in distinct and different ways. And then in, in many, yeah, in many ways, various ways, it means uh, fashions or manner, ways. He has spoken to us in various lots of ways. Think about it. He's spoken through narrative. He's spoken through prophets and teachers. He's spoken to shepherds and herders. He has spoken through uh, apocalyptic literature and, and love songs and wisdom. He has spoken to us in so many ways. And he's saying primarily through prophets that have come, but in, but here it is verse two in these last days. So from this time on to the end of time, the last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Watch this. Firstborn son, heir of everything that is God's, and through whom also he made the universe. Like this big mic drop after two verses. Wait, so this one who walked among us, God man, made everything that is. We see this in places like Ephesians, where everything was for him and through him and by him. To him, all things have been created. Now, if you're new uh, to the faith or you're here uh, as a seeker trying to, and I'm assuming you are since you're here, you're trying to figure out what is this all about? And this is mind blowing. Admittedly, wait, God, Jesus became, God became a man, the incarnation in the flesh. He walked among us. This same Jesus was the creator of everything. So he, he didn't lose his divinity in coming, added his is humanity, God, man, Jesus, the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He comes and he's the one who created everything. And yes, it's a mystery. And yes, it's hard to grasp, but we're going to see how he articulates this. Because here's the thing, what he's saying here in Matthew 20, uh, 23, 34, Jesus says this almost casually. Jesus says, um, I've been sending you Prophets and teachers and wise men and, and women coming along, proclaiming. I've been sending them to you and you keep killing them. What Je Think about this. Jesus is saying, I'm the force behind all of this, but I'm not just another one. I am the one they've been pointing to. I'm, I'm the, the culmination of it all. And I've been the force behind all of this communication that's gone on. I mean, we, we could say it this way. God has revealed himself first foundationally. Don't need the Bible for this. Through simple cause and effect, right? The uncaused cause of everything that is. You don't get something from nothing unless the only, the only, way, that, the only way the atheist can go is the same argument, I guess, that we use, which is God's always existed. Wait, that's mind-blowing. The atheist says, well, um, the natural world's always, always existed. Really? No, there's, there's the uncaused cause. Everything else has come from him. He spoke it all into existence. And we're still, we haven't yet discovered all that he spoke, even still. And we never will. And off into eternity, we'll be enjoying all things that are eternal. But Jesus says, I'm behind all this. In fact, you know this in the Old Testament, the King James in particular, uh, it says, um, you know, the, the prophet says, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord this. Thus say, Jesus never said, thus saith the Lord. Jesus said, I say to you. In fact, Jesus said, you've heard it said, but, but I say to you. And he doesn't, he doesn't come to, to contradict or abolish the law, the way of God. Okay. He, in fact, fulfills the law. And he says, you've heard even in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, the law says this. And that was central to the Jewish, right? Jewish faith. Still is. The law is central. What God has said, we must obey. And Jesus says, well, you've heard that, but let me tell you. And he gets to the heart of the law because he's God and he knows the heart of the law. And he, he says, I am the one this is all pointing to. Now look at verse three. This is an amazing passage of scripture. By the way, you've already captured this. This is, um, uh, I think Tim Keller called it or from somewhere. It's nosebleed theology is what this is. This is like, you know, high elevation Christology. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. Okay? He's the expression of his character. His glory is the expression of his character. And, and namely his holiness. 
Holiness is not just one of his attributes. It's the one that separates him in every one of his attributes. He's holy in his love. He's, ho- he's perfect. He's other in his justice. He's holy in his mercy. See, he's holy in, in all things. And he's, this is what this is. He's the exact radiance and the exact representation. Here's another interesting Greek word. It means mark. It means, it means a, an imprint. Okay, like a stamp. Damp. So here's something you can see, but here it is now exact representation in Jesus. I say it this way. Jesus is perfect theology. He is perfect theology embodied, which is why, and we've often said this in recent days because it's so necessary. When people say the Bible says, and then generally it's, you know, to beat you over the head with something, um, it's to agree with me. And the Bible says this and this. And what we've done, we, we want to claim biblical truth, people do this, and yet they don't look or, or live like Jesus at all. And if your theology doesn't match up with what we call the way of Jesus, a life that looks like the life, forgiveness, the grace, the mercy, the compassion of Jesus, then you're, you're off. Jesus embodied theology perfectly because he is God in the flesh. This is what he's saying, exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He's creator and sustainer. Everything's being held together by him. Now this word, y'all heard the word logos, likely. That's not the word. This is the word rhema. This is spoken word, which is hearkening back to God spoke things into existence. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. There's two things going on here. Think about it. 1,500 years prior to Christ, sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. You can read about how even at Passover, thousands of lambs are sacrificed through the years, all those years. Thousands, even millions of animals sacrificed. A bloody religion. Why? Because someone must pay the price for our sins. We can't pay for our own sin. So sacrifices were a part of the Levitical system. And it was what you had to do in order to be forgiven. The priest could not sit down. Jesus comes, offers the final word. The the, the writer will say once and for all, sacrifice for all time. Then he sat down. Why did he sit down? He's finished, is what he said on the cross. He's finished. He's finished. But not only that, he sits down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, which is the place of all authority. Okay, look at verse four. So he became as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So what what is this name? Well, you could say uh, Yahweh is his name. He's inherited the greater name, but even better, I think what the writer's saying, son, he's son. He's the, he's the one who has, has received all things. And, and what's up with angels here? We'll get there. But so far he said, Jesus is a better guy. He's better because he's clear, explicitly God. And then secondly, look at this, he's qualified. Now this is a portion of the text. And he's going to do this often. This is what you would call probably citations, um, in theological terms, I, this is another, maybe it's in uh, law and other places where you have like an excursus. You know what an excursus is? It's like footnotes. These are end notes, but footnotes. Like you've ever read a page, um, a lot of research, like there's a paragraph and then the whole thing is, wow, end notes the rest of the page. You know, it just keeps going. And this is what he's doing now. Citations, because he's going to say, let me tell you now what I've said so far I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay this out, but it's important to understand, speaking to these first century uh, Hebrews, okay, Jews, he's now going to go off on angels. Now, this is something we're like, what? Like, and, or to say, Jesus is better than angels. And we would go, yeah, I think so. I mean, certainly. But this was a big deal because they, there was a belief that, that when God gave the Ten Commandments to to Moses that it was angels who presented the Ten Commandments to him and gave them to him, okay? Now, it's a little fuzzy. Um, The writer of Hebrews kind of makes this point because it was a common belief that this was the case. Some point to other Old Testament scriptures that that state so. But he's just know that he's he's speaking now in the context of the people. So I want to bust through this because there's a lot here. And there's a lot of references here. This is where he starts to quote now the first of 69 
quotations from the Old Testament throughout the book of Hebrews, which you might anticipate because he's making an apologetic, a defense that Jesus is better and I'm going to draw from your history. Um, By the way, that's a good word for us. When you're challenged by someone's beliefs or you want to hear more from someone, be a good listener, but you need to be able to argue their side of the case. Like a lot of lawyers know this. Be able, to, be able to say, I think I understand your, your position so well. I think I could argue it for you. So let me make sure I got this right. And this is, this is what the writer has done. This is why others would say, this is kind of Pauline, the way he's coming at us here apologetically, um, or in terms of defense. Now look at verse five. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you're my son. Today I have become your father. That is to say, I have begotten you, Okay. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Who's he saying said this to any angels? He's drawn from Psalm 2, from uh, 2 Samuel 7. Look at verse 6. And again, when God brings uh, his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Now he's saying God alone is worthy of worship. He's saying angels, heavenly beings worship him. Okay. Now, you can see how he's just drawing back. Like, you've already made this point, but now he's saying, and here's why. He's drawing from Scripture. Look at verse 7, drawn from the Old Testament. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire, Psalm 104. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, O God, will last forever and ever a scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. He's all powerful. He's all just forever. He's talking about Jesus and he's making the point. All the Bible points to Jesus. Like you might be thinking if you know these passages along the way, or I I could reference every one of them. Psalm 45, uh, Isaiah 61. He's gonna gonna keep going. You're gonna be like, wait, was he really? Was that that the intention of the writer and the writer of Hebrews saying, yeah, it was. All these were just types and forms, shadows of what was to come. Look at verse 9. And you, uh, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Now he's the anointed one, a term used only for the Messiah. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth. He's going back to say, see, even scripture says this, Psalm 102, and the heavens are the work of your hands. He's creator of all things. Verse 11, they will perish, but you will remain. Watch this. He's immutable. He's eternal. Pointing to Jesus. They will all wear out like a garment, like a shirt you put on today. You're going to take it off and wear something else later. You're going to wear something else tomorrow. You're going to keep on changing. Jesus doesn't change. Again, I think it's uh, Hebrews 13, 8. The writer says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He's the same always. You're going to remain the same. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. To which of the angels, verse 13, did God ever say, sit at my right hand? You see, he's going back to everything he said. Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So aren't they all these messengers here to point us to him and then to serve, to show us even more and more? Now, we're not going to get into angelology and such, but what he's simply saying is, you guys think angels are awesome. No, no, no. They're messengers, yes. Jesus is the ultimate messenger, and they've all been pointing to him. Jesus is a better guide because he's clear. He's a better guide because he's qualified. We don't need to look for a new and improved savior. And here's a word. Let me pause for a moment to say this. Some of you are waiting on more from God. Some of you are waiting to say, I I want to believe. And yes, faith is a challenge for us. But praise God, it's faith. It's not up to how good you are, how smart you are. Some of us are waiting on God. You might be waiting on God. I I want to see, see more before I commit myself to him. Or I want to see more about what's up before I really join the church or make a proclamation of faith through baptism. And here's the thing you need to hear today. God's waiting on you because he's already revealed himself to you. And I'll I'll just say this. The writer says that this has come from Jesus straight to us. We have heard. Now I bring it to you. And I could say today, now I, through my voice, everyone hearing, 
I'm bringing the truth of God's word to you. And the writer would say, what more do you need? Like, this is it. So how do we respond to this? Okay, finally, I want you to see that Jesus is constant. Now we move to uh, the first part of chapter two, where we see the first of five warning passages in the book of Hebrews. A good guide is one who stays alert and says, don't go that way, don't go that way. This is a warning now. And Jesus is the one who tells us, not that there's a newer, better way, because it's constantly changing. Instead, he never changes. And it says this, look at verse one of chapter two. Therefore, this is the first therefore um, in the book of of Hebrews, by the way. And y'all know this. When you see, therefore, you ask. Sorry. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. So this term, paid close attention, is is a unique kind of Greek construction as well. It means to be furiously obsessed, like fixated, focused, obsessed over this. Over what? Over all that you've heard. Therefore, over all that you've heard, over who Jesus is, pay closer to be be furiously obsessed with what you've heard. Why not? Uh, or why? Because you're going to drift away if you don't. Friends, this is it. This is the gospel. This is the Christian life. Like, it's not move on to something better. Like, like we don't preach, oh, you got the gospel. Let's move on to something else. There's nothing more than the gospel. There's nothing deeper than the gospel. You can't scrutinize the gospel enough. You can't apply it enough. His love for us is eternal. And what he's accomplished for us, we, we've got to get underneath it. It's why it's all we talk about. We're obsessed with it. Because here's the problem in our lives. Even as Christians, tomorrow you'll wake up and you're going to head off into the week. You're going to face some anxiety along the way. You're going to face some real challenges. You're going to like, do some crazy things this week. We all do. But it, I could argue it's because we have drifted We've slipped away. It's always a slow fade. It's all, it's rarely does somebody just go off the rails overnight. Instead, it's a slow fade. What is it? Well, you know, he started drinking and then that's where it all went wrong. He was doing, he had problems. Then he got, no, no, no. It's when we forget who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And that we're so loved by him that we're defined by him. I don't need to justify myself in other places in my life or before another person. Yes, I'm going to be kind and such, but he's going to be the one who identifies uh, or, or gives me my identity. And when we forget that, when we drift from that, that's when we enter into sin and a life that we were never meant to live. That is why this is core. And he said, don't do it. Stay, stay focused, fiercely obsessed with Jesus. Look at verse two. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. Okay, now let's pause for a moment. Now he's saying all of the law. I mean, you think of the law. It's not just like, well, the 10 commandments, but it's all the law. It means God's holy demands on how we're to live our lives. All of that has been proven to be true. And every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. Now listen to this. We all have a hunch. We all know this is true. Again, don't need the Bible for this. It's, it's, it's what C.S. Lewis, among others, would call the moral argument for the existence of God. We all have a hunch of what's right and wrong. Now you say, no, I work with a sociopath. You know, I know somebody who, you know, um, well, maybe, maybe, but n- not likely. I mean, it's, it's as simple as you go to a restaurant today, you, you put your stuff down, your family's sitting around, you go to the bathroom, come back, and somebody's sitting in your seat. Like, likely you're going to go, I'm sorry, that. I was like, my seat. <laughs> I was here a minute ago, and it's kind of weird. You're sitting with my family. But... And if the person were like, no, no, this is my seat. Like, no, I mean, you got up, okay, whatever. But no, this is my, like most everybody would go, wrong. This is wrong, okay? I mean, we got it. This, that's a weird illustration. But um, <laughs> we all know, we have a sense. And what he's saying is this. We've, none of us can live up to the holy demands of God. They are crushing And when we turn away from doing what is right, we pay the price for it. There's built-in consequence. Parents, you need to know this. Let consequences play out in your children's life. It's the only way they're really going to learn. It's the only way we learn as adults. And we know if I go against God's laws, what is right, and do what is wrong, there is just retribution. Meaning, 
I get what I deserve. If you believe in justice at all, we just don't like it coming our way, right? But the point is, it's built in. It's part of the system. And he's saying, everybody knows this. How then, if this is true, what's already been presented, we cannot keep up with the law. We are, we are crushed under its demands. How then, verse three, shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? That has already come to us. It was declared at first by the Lord. Now here it is. Watch this. The Lord Jesus attested to us by those who heard. Apostles. Now this is why some would say this is not Paul. Paul would never say. I heard this second hand at third hand somewhere else. I heard it directly from Jesus. And this, even this language you could argue is a little fuzzy. So, but what we think this is someone right in the apostolic circles there. And while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. He's saying, Jesus, to the apostles, to us, and again, me, today, to you. The truth of how you can receive salvation in the Lord Jesus. This is your day. And we've also seen this through all the gifts that he's distributed to his sons and daughters. Like we know this too, right? I know Jesus better because I know you. I know of him because of the gifts that you have that I don't have. I've seen it and I see it in the church and we all have been given spiritual gifts to use for his glory. And this is how we all come to know him better and better. Now, this is interesting. The writer saying it's all been proven reliable. How much more if we reject this great salvation that's come to us in Jesus how much more would we pay the price and miss out on what he has done for us? All of this is binding. And now the gospel preached and presented, you know, what has he presented to us? What is he, he's shown us that we can't save ourselves. We can't justify ourselves. Um, we can't be justified before a holy God. We are still crushed under the demands of his holiness. We need a savior. And, and only Jesus has bridged the gap so that we don't have to justify ourselves because we couldn't. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, he'd be saying amen to all that I'm saying right here. Like, yes, yes, what he's saying, this is it. This is, this is the point I'm trying to make is that you can't do it yourself. So God had to send his own son himself in the flesh to live out the perfect law because no one could. So we receive it by faith, not by our works, praise God, not by how smart we are. So we receive it by faith. We believe and this, again, is hard for a lot. Oh, it's the belief thing again. So hard to believe. But I say it, you know, often, praise God, it's, it's belief. And not your hard work because you can't do it. Everyone is welcome. Everyone's included. And yet, if you're hearing this right, you're going, man, this sounds exclusive. Because it is. And, and we, we get crazy about that in our culture today, don't we? Because we live in a culture... Many say, you know, post-truth, which is by definition post-Christian culture. We have ghosts of, Chris, of Christian Christendom past. Um, but more and more, we're shifting away. And we're seeing this, right? Like, let's just all get along. I mean, here's, here's the other moral vision, um, apart from Christianity. A secular vision is, let's just, we can have world peace if we all just get along. And the way that we get along is, look, there is no truth. I and mean, that's really where this has to go. Your truth up against my truth, let's just, we'll all get along. Truth is subjective. There is no truth. And as I've noted, if that statement is true, then, it, then it's not true. Talk about that over lunch uh, later on. But to say, here, and here's the thing. People say, you Christians, you know, you're so dogmatic or religious people, or you say, you claim there's truth and Gosh, it's so exclusive, and it's even now not just, that's a little weird. Now it's, no, you're, you're part of the problem. You all are what's crazy in the world. But think about this. To say that there is no truth, that all truth is subjective, is a major truth claim. I mean, you follow me? You're saying that everybody else who makes a truth claim is wrong. And you'd have to say, Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You'd have to say he's wrong. And maybe you're like, you know, I don't know about that, but I, I know that you just can't make exclusive claims like that. 
Because the world I live in, there is no truth. And I just want everybody to get along. Well, we all want to get along. But the way we're going to get along is when peace comes to us personally. I don't have to justify myself. I don't, I don't have, and I don't have to come at you. I want to live a life that looks like Jesus. I don't want to speak truth, yes, but I'm going to do it in love. And, and I want you to see that, that Jesus is better. The problem with many non-believers, they look at us and they go, I'm not sure Jesus is better. Because we have this syncretism of Jesus plus something, plus the world's power, plus politics or whatever else. And they're going, Jesus is no better. Your Jesus is not, your life is no better than mine. And the writer of Hebrews saying, he's saying, listen, listen, don't give up. Don't drift because there's nothing in the world like Jesus. There is no religion in the world like Jesus because Jesus is not a religion. Jesus is a is Yahweh in the flesh who's come to make things right with us. And once we are at peace with him, it starts with him. We can be at peace with ourselves. Then we can be at peace with others. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says, and he'll say over and over again, the message doesn't change because Jesus is the message and he doesn't change. The truth doesn't change. Jesus is the truth and he doesn't change. God's mercy doesn't, he is mercy personified. His forms of righteousness or whatever you must do, perfection doesn't change. It's why we always need him. Brothers and sisters, don't you dare go back to the law, back to the world, to say, I think this, this is way too hard for me. This is dangerous. This is, if I fully understand this, listen, be furiously obsessed with him. Just stay focused on him. And we're going to do all we can as, as shepherds and guides, as leaders, as preachers, to say it's all about Jesus. We are obsessed with him. Just look at him. You know, I've said it before. Stop trying to be like him. Just look at him. Just behold him. And you will then, yes, want to be like him. But you'll be transformed because of who he is and his love for you. It's his grace that changes everything. And I'm going to close with this because um, we've left time for us to, to enter into the Lord's Supper together. Not to rush out, okay? There's no other time in the week you're going to do this. Be together with other brothers and sisters in the Lord and to be reminded of how good Jesus is. And, and I want to read um, a quote from N.T. Wright, who's a um, professor, Oxford professor, theologian. He writes this. Listen to this. How can you live with the terrifying thought that the hurricane has become human? That the fire has become flesh? That life itself came to life and walked in our midst. Christianity either means that or it means nothing. It is either the more devastating disclosure of the deepest reality in the world or it's a sham, a nonsense, a bit of deceitful play acting. Most of us unable to cope with saying either of those things condemn ourselves to live in the shadow, in the shallow world in between. Friends, the world has seen enough of the cultural Christian who's decided it's Jesus plus something else. It's a syncretism of, of all the worldly beliefs and stuff and Jesus. We'll add him to the mix. How are you living your life these days? Is he really central? Are you really furiously obsessed with him? You say, how would I know? There'd be some signs. I, I think you, your prayer life, though a challenge often, your prayer life would reveal you're just crying out to him like we learned in the Psalms. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to say all the right things. You come to him. You're probably in his word, like obsessed with it, frankly. And can I say it in our context? If you remember, you're probably reading scripture with us and you're probably talking about it with others. If you're not, that would be your commitment today to grab one of these on your way out and say, I'm, I'm diving in. I'm going to be in the word daily and I'm going to be obsessed with what he is saying to me through his word. You probably would say, I, I, I need to join the fellowship of the church. You'd probably be a member of a local church. 
like really obsessed with other believers and, and encouraging and blessing. Had others join this morning who said, I'm just, I'm, and I'm here, I'm ready to serve. I don't want to just, I'm, yes, I'm in a connect group. I, I want to serve. And we have a group even now at Discover Park Cities who are learning all about our church and how they can get involved and serve. And you can do the same today.